Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the uh, June 26, 2021 edition of the Saturday Free School for Philosophy and Black Liberation from Philadelphia. Uh, I'm Jahan here with Jake, uh, Jeremiah, Kim, Caleb, and as always uh, with Dr. Tony Montero, who we'll began our discussion with some remarks. Okay. Thanks a lot, Joe. And, um, you know, I just want to uh, give a shout out to your lecture tomorrow, 8.30 a.m., uh, which is going to be broadcast in India on the crisis of Western and American democracy. So you can say more about it. And just, um, uh, just to let everybody know, we're a month away from the Free School and Lotus Collective and Organization for Positive Peace and the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the Non-Aligned Reading Group, uh, our joint uh, commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the founding of the, Ch of the Communist Party of China. We'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, but uh, obviously uh, what we're going to do uh, at the end of July uh, is our own uh, imprint, our own, um, uh, how could you say, our statement on this huge ideological political struggle of the West against China and the rise of the new uh, uh, paradigm of people's democracy. We'll get to that. Uh, but I guess one of the most uh, bizarre, if not ironic events was uh, the chairman of the Joint uh, Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley. Now the Joint Chiefs of Staff is the um, uh, coming together of all of the armed services of the United States. And Mark Milley is the head of literally and symbolically of the US armed forces. And I should just uh, add the largest, most toxic, most aggressive uh, military in human history. Uh, no military has carried out successively as many wars and genocidal wars for that matter, uh, as has the US military. So when the uh, chairman of all of the military services uh, joined together, Mark Milley, when he declares that Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist is required reading for the military top brass as well as for the enlisted men and women, you know you are in deep trouble. Uh, when the military of the United States, and we should add uh, the national security state, that is the FBI, the CIA, national intelligence, and well, they say 12, I don't, we don't know how many um, agencies of the deep state of the security state are involved here, when they, along with the Pentagon, along with the military services are now woke. Uh, what is this? And how do you distinguish wokeness from ideological clarity? I guess, um, you know, I, um, I guess we cannot separate this ideological reset in the name of democracy and in the name of uh, challenging China and challenging the quote, domestic threats, which they define. And this is what should set off all kinds of alarm bells, which they define as white supremacy. The ruling class, which has been the principal pillar of white supremacy in the history of the United States in the second part of the 20th century as it waged wars against the peoples of the darker nations, Africa and Asia and South America and the Caribbean. White supremacist wars are now in the vanguard of fighting white supremacy. The question is what's going on, uh, to quote Marvin Gaye. 
but I think we know what's going on. Um, you know, I wrote an article, my last article, by the way, for the Black Agenda Report in, um, I think it was November, 2020. And in that article, I warned against the left. Uh, sometimes we call it the fictive left, the self-defined left. I warned them against what was their alliance with the high tech Silicon Valley, Wall Street or high finance, the military, the big media, uh, and the Democratic Party in the 2020 election. Uh, now, people say, well, what would you have suggested for them? Well, I could have suggested many things, protest votes where that was possible, or how people could view a protest vote, or to take a position, we support neither candidate in this race. They didn't do any of that. They joined a cabal, which was committed to reestablishing the rule of the 1% of the one tenth of 1%. They supported that in the name of fighting fascism. And their definitions of fascism uh, would not fit any historic experience anywhere in the world, including Germany and Italy, where, where the whole thing began, fascism was, was invented, so to speak. Their definition fit none of that, but it demonized a sizable section of the working class and defined them as white supremacists and thus defined the ruling elite that most dangerous parasitic cabal as woke, or as Gerald Horn said, in the vanguard of the fight against white supremacy. Um, and thus, I warned against it. I said the left cannot win in this alliance, and the left has not won. That political practice, that alliance has led to the demise of what was defined as the left. And it was a mishmash and of, of all kinds of theories and practices and nonsense, uh, everything from transgenderism uh, to wokeness uh, to uh, uh, whatever you want to the 1619 project, the counter revolution of 1776, ideas that have never, that have no legacy in the history of the left of revolutionary struggle, of struggles for freedom, and certainly did not resonate. In fact, went against every tradition of progressive democratic people struggle in this country and was organized with all of these crazy theories and nonsense, was organized upon one principle, taking down the working class and preventing it from unifying, and then, as is the case with all ruling class ideas, blaming it all on the working class itself. We cannot lose sight of this. They blame the working class for its disunity while they join the ruling class. And I'm talking about the Bezos and, and the Facebooks and the high tech and the high finance. The left joined them in attacking the working class. The greatest casualty from my point of view in this, the left generally has become the casualty of this as interestingly, the social democrat, SDSA, Democratic Socialists of America have now become a wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, by the way, the Democratic Party, uh, not so democratic, by the way. 
the party of big wealth, the wealthiest party in the history of the world. No party in human history or in the history of political parties, let us say, has ever represented such a concentration of wealth as the Democratic Party does. And it's no secret. They flaunt it. They don't hide it. And the left, left, feels comfortable in being a part of this. And DSA feels comfortable in being a wing and mechanism of this party of wealth. In 2020, the counties, the 525 or so counties, won by the Democratic Party in the presidential race, represented, what is it now, 70, uh, 71% of all of the wealth and income in the United States. Donald Trump's party, 2,500 counties represented less than 30% of the wealth. That only begins to tell us the architecture and essence of politics, of political parties in the United States. I warned the left, don't go there. Stop attacking the working class. Yes, there are contradictions and weaknesses in the working class. That comes with the system. Any leftist should know that. The ruling class rules because it can keep the people divided. What are you, what are you doing? Further dividing the working class with your theories of settler colonialism? So you piled on. You did not resist that attack upon the working class. You resisted any effort of working people to fight back against their oppression and exploitation. The greatest casualty, again, from my point of view, has been the Black Agenda Report, a huge loss in the ideological struggle, and we have lost it. It was like a coup d'etat. It happened so quickly. It happened so thoroughly where you had to look at it and ask the question, is this a COINTELPRO operation? Obviously it was both external and internal. It played upon internal contradictions in order to bring down a brilliant voice and to silence the genius of Glenn Ford. And I consider him a genius and a courageous person. Perhaps it all came to a head for me when Black Agenda Report republished an essay from the Atlantic Magazine. If you don't know, because people don't read it, it's, an, it's for the elite. But it is a magazine that ideologically has supported wars, especially this last set of wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya. They supported it all in the 2020 election. The Atlantic became a platform for retired generals to attack Trump and his proposals to leave NATO and to leave Afghanistan and to not get further involved in wars of regime change. They attacked his policy on North Korea and on the Korean Peninsula, but it did not attack it from the standpoint of a greater peace, a deeper peace, but from the standpoint of more military spending, more military aggression, including claiming, for example, that the Russians were paying Taliban fighters to kill, quote, our soldiers in Afghanistan. The, the uh, uh, Atlantic was in the forefront of the Russiagate hoax and lie. So to republish an article from the Atlantic 
I don't care who it was written by, you know, is, was an act of ideological betrayal and represented an irreversible undoing of Black Agenda Report. But then the article they published was, was by Ibram Kendi less than a year after I had published in the Black Agenda Report an article critiquing and demonstrating that Kendi was an invention of the ruling class to address deep and profound ideological crisis of the system and the crisis of legitimacy, the crisis of rule of the ruling class, and then to public. But that was only representative of a deeper and larger problem of the left aligning with the party of finance, capital, and big tech, and, and the military, that is the Democratic Party. There's no two ways about, around it. The undoing of Black Agenda Report is a tragedy beyond words. And you can only process it by how it makes you feel the emptiness that it leaves us with and the absence of a great tribune of the people is gone. But the crisis continues as the ruling class likes to define it, quote, our democracy and the threat of China. But even as they launch these, uh, these slogans, these headlines, in their calmer moments, they tell the truth and admit what is true. Now I'm a person that reads the op-ed pages of newspapers. In fact, uh, I always tell people you know, people say, I don't like to read newspapers. I don't either. Uh, but if you want to get a subscription to any newspaper, I would say get, get a su subscription to the newspaper that has the best op-ed writers. Uh, and I would say that's uh, generally the Financial Times. And by the best op-ed writers, I'm talking about those who, in their writing, over time, suggest the debates, contradictions, and directions ideologically of the ruling elite. Uh, from, from my money, there's nothing better than the Financial Times. But second or third to that is the New York Times op-ed piece. And there's certain people I read and take seriously and certain of them that I don't. Uh, Thomas Friedman, uh, I do not take seriously. He's a clown, he's a joke. Um, uh, Paul Krugman uh, is not a serious economist, although he won a Nobel Peace Prize for economics and for what I have no idea. Uh, but there are people like Nicholas Kristof and he had a, uh, a op-ed on uh, June 23rd. And I'll, I'll read you the headline. The biggest threat to America is America itself. Here we have a strategic ideological displacement of the popular political line of the ruling class, i.e. that the biggest threat to America is China. And in this article, I just like, let me just read uh, a, a, a short part of it because it helps to see. Um, he, he indicates that the whole split in income and everything, there is no more upward mobility. The quote, middle class is in decline and unraveling. And he says, uh, how do we, uh, uh, one second, please. Uh, 
He says, so it's great that we again have a president respected by the world. He's reflecting upon Biden's you know, trip to, um, uh, to Europe and that, uh, and that performance. But we are not back and we must face the reality that our greatest vulnerability is not what other countries do to us, but, we, but what we have done to ourselves. The United States cannot achieve its potential when so many Americans are falling short of their potential. Well, isn't that what we've been saying? That the crisis of the US system is not externally driven, it is internally driven. To put it another way, the contradictions of the political system and of the economic system have become so intense and so severe that the, prob that the, the probability is that these contradictions have now become existential, where the system will not be able and the ruling class will not be able to resolve these contradictions. It is not unusual that a system in decline reaches such an existential moment. And in many ways, we are there, Nicola, Nicholas Kristof in his way of talking, you know, the polite uh, uh, way of talking, admits that fact. Uh, but the, what, the article that I, I would like, if you don't mind, I just wanna read this article to everybody. It's, um, or at least parts of it. It's Martin Wolf from the Financial Times. Uh, let me just kind of tell you about a lot of what he says and then maybe quote his conclusions. What Martin Wolf establishes uh, in this essay, and it was published um, on June 22nd, a day before the Nicholas Kristof article was published. And the title of Martin Wolf's article is The Healing of Democracies Starts at Home. You know, the healing. In other words, to use our language, the resolving of the contradictions of US democracy, quote, democracy, and of the US system itself is not the Russians, quote, meddling in our elections, or it's not the Chinese uh, inventing COVID-19 and not telling anybody until it got over here. It is not the Chinese stealing our technology. Wolf and Kristoff are in agreement, and I agree with them. The crisis is based, is anchored, I should say, rooted in the internal contradictions of the system. This is very important for people to know. A lot of people say, well, I don't, I've thrown up my hands, I can't understand any of this, and I'm not going to try, I'm just going to live my life out. Well, for many people, that's all they can do. And I understand that. Uh, uh, Many people are suffering badly, uh, materially and economically. Half of the American population are either poor or close to poverty. It's even worse let it, in the, in the African-American and, and many of the Latino communities, yes. Uh, but then there's also the spiritual crisis, the psychological crisis. The American people are collectively anxious and depressed. It is, uh, the, the depression is at pathological levels. People are acting out, people are violent. People don't see a way out. And that's from the poorest to the most privileged. People with elite university educations are as prone to commit suicide as those who don't even have a GED. So here we are, 
a population that is deeply unhappy, unhappy with the country, unhappy with the ruling class, and people have thus withdrawn. Withdrawal is a form of what philosophers call nihilism. Pessimism is something else. A lot of people equate the two. Well, they are parallel. But nihilism philosophically is the retreat into oneself, into one's, here we go, sexuality. I'm going to resolve the crisis of the system by transforming my sexual identity. These are teenagers saying this. They barely know what sex is. Their concerns for most of their lives have been to play, to learn, to enjoy. And suddenly they're being told you have to make a choice about whether you're a woman or a man at 14 years old. This is horrible. The trans movement, I would argue, and if you don't agree with me, we can debate it, is a manifestation of a society in nihilistic decline. The woke movement, the Black Lives Matter movement was neither a civil rights movement, nor was it about black people. And most black people will tell you that because they did not join these marches. It is very, very clear that the so-called Black Lives Matter, which by the way, last summer received $90 million from corporate philanthropists and directly from rich people. And most of it was stolen. Most of it was stolen. You know, and one of the, the heads of the founders of the, of the label of the brand had to quit because she was found to be corrupt and using the money to steal. Uh, Joe Dorsey, the co-founder of Twitter last year gave $10 million to Ibram Kendi. And as Dorsey said, no strings attached. In other words, no oversight, do whatever you wanna do with it. A totally corrupt, and corrupting practice. And it is here, it is here that we see if we can read what is going on properly, if we can decode all of this, that the ruling class is in crisis, is in trouble. They will invent a movement where there wasn't one. They will define a movement as a civil rights movement when it was nothing of the sorts. People say, well, all of these people marching, how could you not acknowledge them? I acknowledge them and I acknowledge that it was a confusion. There was no leadership. There is no movement of any consequence where you can't say that she or he is the spokesperson or the leader and amorphous anarchistic, we're gonna have a march next week and we're gonna announce it on Twitter and Facebook and all y'all show up and people looking to be relevant, especially young people show up and embrace slogans that go against the sentiments and feelings of masses of people such as defund the police. Where the hell did that come from? and abolish the police while murder rates are increasing. Not reform the police, abolish the police. And a quote, cultural renaissance, which is everything but culture and is not anchored to the great artistic, intellectual, musical culture, people's culture that is disproportionately driven by Afro-America to have a cultural renaissance that does not reference that, in fact, attacks it. 
whose culture and for what purpose this cultural renaissance. It is the work of a parasitic, selfish, destructive ruling class, which can do nothing better than dummy the people down, attack their con consciousness, make the masses feel that they are their worst enemies. The natural and normal tendency of working people in the worst times to go after their oppressors and their exploiters, the ruling class through its control of the media, of publishing, of all of the mechanisms of ideology and propaganda, turn the people against themselves. And the so-called left is complicit and must go down in history as part of this betrayal of the working class. There has never been a credible left that attacks working people, except this one. And that's what it has done. Let me just, and part of what Martin Wolf says, he, he like uh, uh, Nicholas Kristol, is reflecting upon Biden's uh, trip to the group of seven in London, or wherever that was in England, somewhere in England, and then his meeting with NATO in Brussels, and then his uh, uh, meeting or so-called summit with Putin. And at the center of Biden's trip is that America is back and we're prepared to, quote, lead the democracies of the world, as they call themselves, the rich democracy. They have no shame in their game. The rich democracies, while in the United States, half of the people are poor or close to poverty. So this is, and well, we'll get, we'll get to that in a minute. And what Martin Wolf says, he says that even though we are in a crisis of democracy in, in the West, and we are, we are, he says, but look at what we have, look at our riches. We have the best universities. We have the best technology. We're rich. We have the best democracy. We have all of this. And then he asks, but why do we have all these problems? And since we have all of this, why are the world's people not running and embracing us and wanting to be like us? Why do more of the world's people increasingly look upon China as the paradigm of the future? Why are more and more nations signing up to the Belt and Road Initiative? Interestingly, Biden wants to talk about infrastructure. You know what Belt and Road is? A global infrastructure program. Pakistan, Iran, you have problems of financing your infrastructure and infrastructure of ports and rail and airports and all of that is so important to international commerce. Let's do it together, China and Pakistan, China and Iran, Iran, Isfahan, the beautiful city of Isfahan. In fact, Duke Ellington has written a wonderful composition called Isfahan. Isfahan became in back, as they say, back in the real days, became this hub of civilization, of trade in the first Silk Road. And now Isfahan is rising again in the new Silk Road. The darker nations, as Du Bois taught us, are driving democracy. And so Martin Wolf says, we have all of this going for us. But then he says, he says, 
But why is autocracy? Autocracy means everything that does not bow down to the values and, and so on of the West. Autocracy is ascending and democracy, meaning the West and the ruling class are in decline. And the Chinese economy, which 20 years ago was 7% of world production and trade is today 19%, which in 1978, China was about not even measurable, a measurable part of world trade and finance. Today is 19% and is ascending. The renminbi, the, the, the yuan, the Chinese currency, is now increasingly a part of a back basket of currencies. Iran and China breaking through the Western imposed sanctions. Now trade, not in currency, but in commodities. Your oil for our uh, ore, or your oil for our technology. And so the sanctions, be they on Russia, be they on China, be they on Iran or North Korea, are increasing less important as the dollar is increasingly less important. So for Martin Wolf and the ruling class, this is an alarming crisis of democracy, the ascension of quote autocracy. I wanna explain all these terms because to read this, you have to decode it. You can't, and this is what frustrates a lot of people, I understand it. That's why I welcome every, come to the free school. You're not gonna hurt yourself. You know, you're gonna help yourself more than anything else. If you, if you think I'm a boycott the free school because all they do is talk, well, you're not helping yourself because most people that deprecate strategic and ideological conversations uh, uh, are hurting themselves. And if you are waiting, if you think you are waiting for that quote, great revolutionary moment when everybody rises up and overturns the old system, it's never gonna happen that way. Has never happened. Didn't happen in Russia that way. Didn't happen in China that way. Didn't happen in Korea that way. Didn't happen in the civil rights movement that way. Every great movement requires a long period of ideological preparation. Everybody tells you that. Lenin tell you that, Fidel tell you that, uh, Mao Tse Tung. Everybody says the same thing. We had to study. We had to study our own history. We had to study ideas and great ideas. They all went outside of China for the most part, except Mao. All the leaders, Zhu Da, Deng Xiaoping, Zhou Enlai, why did they come to the West? To study the Western system, to study Western ideas, not to reject their own civilization, but to overcome the weaknesses and contradictions, which would have to be overcome in, in the Chinese situation, in the Russian, through revolutionary struggle. But then, okay, let me just, I, I'm getting, uh, uh, Martin Wolf says, the high income democracies, that's what he calls us now. High income democracy. Well, who's high income? <laughs> have you? <laughs> oh, come on, please. But anyway, uh, have highest productivity, whereas China's ranked only 75th. By who? We don't know. If China's only 75th in terms of productivity, well, what is all the uh, clamor about? There's no threat then, right? Uh, he goes on. Uh, he says, having similar economies and political systems, and I would just parenthetically say, and all of y'all based on colonialism and the slave trade, i.e. institutionalized, structured into the system, white supremacy. So y'all similar in all of that. We, he says, we need to coordinate and regulate areas like finance, digital uh, technology and competition. The West needs to come together. Well, hey, that's, a, that's a, a, a Hail Mary pass, let me tell you that. Uh, because already uh, Germany and France have called for a summit with Putin. Uh, the, uh, at the end of, of 2020, right before 
uh, Biden was inaugurated, the European Union, this economic zone, signed a trade and finance agreement with China collectively. Uh, and of course, there's no way in this world that Germany is going to decouple from China, given that Germany's uh, at least one industry, auto industry is completely, almost completely dependent upon sale of cars to China. So uh, I don't care whether it's Trump or Biden, anybody else that lectures Germany about decoupling is not gonna happen. And to add insult to injury, Italy, I think the third largest economy in the European Union has signed on to China's Belt and Road project. And then of course, Japan, uh, the third largest economy in the world uh, is a part of the comprehensive uh, economic, regional economic plan uh, that brings together a number of Asian nations constituting a trade zone and an investment zone and a currency zone, which is the largest in the history of, of, of the world. Uh, and China's at the center of it. I mean, what are we talking about, Martin Wolf? So uh, I'll just say, of course, the framework is Eurocentric. It cannot see the world. It is a narrow worldview that cannot understand the new moment, the axial moment in the rise of Asia. And I'm not just talking about China. We're talking about the Korean Peninsula. And this is huge, huge. The, uh, the, the people driven movement towards unity on the Korean Peninsula. Already, South Korea is the 12th largest economy in the world. Uh, united with North Korea, uh, the sky is the limit. It is clear now that Russia, which has always been a majority Asian nation, is now casting its lot with Asia and the strategic alliance with China. And that Iran goes forward positively and without the West as it is in a strategic alliance with China. And it's not just China doing for others, it's China's own interest and own self-defense being advanced by these trade and political and other alliances, and this is huge. Now, let us just look at China because it is this question, is China democratic? And here we go, free. This is, this is one of the biggest uh, frauds ever uh, brought down the pike, that Western democracy equals freedom. So they can't say democracy without saying freedom, okay? Now, for billions of people around the world, that is a strange connection. You might be, quote, democratic, but you have not promoted freedom. You have promoted the opposite of it. Uh, and we could go down the list in you guys' memory. Uh, the wars in the Middle East, Iraq, uh, you know, uh, Syria, uh, Afghanistan. I was in Afghanistan. Uh, it is the United States which overthrew the secular democracy, the socialist government of Afghanistan in 1979. I know what I'm talking about. If you don't know that, that's why talk is never cheap if it's the right kind of talk. If you don't know that, your understanding of world politics is thrown off. It has not been a 20 year war. It's been more like a 40 year war against Afghanistan. And why? 
Well, let's start with one to three trillion dollars of rare minerals in the earth of Afghanistan and what that will mean. Afghanistan free of US occupation and militarism, where does it go? Not to the United States, to China. There's no two ways about it. And of course the China, Russia, Afghanistan, Iraq complex, you get the picture? You get, it's a, it's a hell of a story. Now, Chinese democracy. The West never supported democracy in China. It was they in the 1830s who kicked off the opium wars. Why did they want to sell opium from India and China? Well, obviously it's money to be made just like in, in the United States. Why do you have Kensington in Philadelphia, an open air drug market estimated to be worth a billion dollars a year, money. But then the other thing, to break down the Chinese people, the Chinese people fought against it. They lost the first opium wars. Then you got a great uprising against the Manchu dynasty. Just follow me, people. I don't want to get too, but you know, the last dynasty, which the Chinese people saw as a foreign minority rule dynasty that had ruled for 300 years, had sold the country to France and Germany, the United States and Japan, sold it, and then ruled the country through warlords. All you got to do, establish military terror against your local people and we'll finance you and, you know, and, and all of y'all in charge will get rich. The warlord system. And then in 1911, after the great Taiping uprising, 1850 to 1868, it is estimated that it was such a severe uprising and so intense that close to 70 million people were casualties. It was put down, it did not have leadership, but it was not erased from the memory of revolutionaries in China. And then the Boxer Rebellion, and they call it a Boxer Rebellion because they were boxers. The cats coming out of, uh, uh, what they call them, uh, 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 karate classes and stuff. And they were gonna fight the foreign devils. Then there was the reform movement of the late 1890s where the intellectuals, the educated classes began to get involved. And eventually, the Manchu dynasty fell based upon its own internal contradictions. And for the first time in Chinese history, Sun Yat-sen could declare the Democratic Republic of China, but it was not enough just to declare it. Could power over this vast country and this large population be established? Sun Yat-sen died too soon. Another group took over, headed by Shanghai Shek, took over the Nationalist Party called the KMT, the Kuomintang. And thus, a new form of foreign rule, of domestic terror and domination of the peasantry and of the people and working people of China was set off. But in 1921, a historic event happened on the 1st of July, the founding of the Communist Party of China, with people like Mao Zedong uh, and, and Zhou Enlai and others. They looked to the Russian Revolution. They looked to Lenin and Stalin. But they came under severe repression, murderous repression. And Kuomintang and his clique committed themselves to not just defeating them, but as they said, to exterminate the Chinese communists. But then the communists in this vast country had established what we would call liberation zones. They called them Soviets or red zones throughout the country, deep into the countryside where they couldn't be reached by the uh, urban centered elites and their armies. But then, 
uh, there came a moment in this civil war after Japan had occupied the Northeast of China in 1931 and was spreading its tentacles, where this guy Shanghai Shek said, we're gonna finally wipe out the communist. And it forced under the leadership of the communist party and eventually Mao Zedong, what is called the long march. 1934 to 1936, a 6,000 mile retreat, tactical retreat. They were not surrendering, they were retreating to a position where they could fight more effectively. The Long March is a moment in human history, a historic transition, transformational moment that would affect the world and world revolutionary struggle. It's symbolism, which by the way, has been written about brilliantly by uh, American writers, such as Edgar Snow, uh, Helen Foster Snow, um, uh, Agnes Smedley, uh, uh, and others have written brilliantly about this and interviewed these very obscure people who were obscure, but as they saw it, impressionably so, represented the future. They interviewed Mao Zedong. They interviewed Zhu Dao, the military genius. They interviewed uh, Zhou Enlai and Deng Xiaoping, you know, the future leaders of China. But then after defeating the Japanese uh, in by 1945, a four-year civil war between the communist-led liberation forces. And I want to emphasize this, it was not just the communists. It was a multi-party united front that defeated the Jap that defeated the Kuomintang. And on October 1st, 1949, Mao Zedong on behalf of the victorious forces declared, and I want to underline this, the People's Republic of China. Sun Yat-sen declared the Democratic Republic of China. In the history of bourgeois revolutions, be it the French or the American Revolution, they never declared a people's republic because they were not people's republics. But Mao declares a people's republic. And in so doing, declares a Communist Party led state. And at that moment, it was, in all essentials, the dictatorship of the proletariat as against the dictatorship of the landlords and foreign uh, investors and armies. I want to make that clear. In a dialectical sense, the dictatorship of the proletariat emerges from a victorious liberation struggle. And it is the power of the people over the power of the landlords, foreign occupiers, and warlords. I hope that makes sense. If you look at these claims, isolated and outside of the struggle for power, you'll never understand anything. And of course, uh, Western and, and American propaganda is designed to make sure you don't understand anything. China, over the next 70 years, not to mention the previous 100 years, nothing has come easy. It's been difficult. It's all been difficult. The new state that was being constructed was being developed in the midst of some of the worst poverty humanity has ever seen. China was poor. China was not united. The communists, although victorious in the fight against the uh, Kuomintang and Shanghai Shek were not really equipped 
to lead the state. They had to learn on the job. They went through many difficulties, wrong policies, correct policies. Uh, probably uh, the greatest uh, mistake that brought the revolution very close to being undermined was the what was what Mao and his followers called the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. Rather than unite the people, it divided the people. Rather than building confidence in the Communist Party and its leaders, it did the opposite. The country was in ruins at the time that Mao Zedong died. Whether or not the dictatorship of the proletariat could survive, was on the table. It is with the rise of Deng Xiaoping, and I think in the West he's completely misunderstood. I've misunderstood him for some time. It was he and the group of leaders assembled around him which saved China, where comparatively Gorbachev sold his country for nothing to the West, Deng Xiaoping and his group said, looking at Russia, this will not happen here. And it did. And interestingly, the state went from the dictatorship of the proletariat to what Martin Jacques calls a civilization state, which is one way to talk about it, to the state of the whole people. In other words, from a situation where in order to hold on to power, the revolutionary forces must use measures that are repressive against their enemies to unite and educate the people, the revolutionary forces must lead, must take command, of the means of education, the means of communication, and the means of production. They did that. But how this occurred, that they transitioned, coming out of the difficult times produced by the Cultural Revolution to the state of the whole people, where today over 80% of the Chinese people went polled by Western polling agencies say that they are satisfied with their government, they're satisfied with their democracy, and most Chinese people are optimistic about the future of their nation. The very opposite is the case in the United States. China's prestige on a global scale is ascending. The United States is descending. We therefore have two models of democracy. First of all, what is democracy? Uh, I prefer not to go back to the Greek definition of demos and rule, uh, that kind of uh, rule of the people, uh, because the people do not rule except through mechanisms of state power. If state power in a democracy is in the hands of a particular class, which at the same time is committed to colonialism and slavery and to uh, class exploitation and wealth and profit, uh, that ruling class can talk about democracy, but its very interests, its class interests, go opposite to people's rule. They have to limit the rule of the people. And they can do that in many ways as we see. So, but democracy properly understood is a method, a mode of the rule of a particular class. For example, when Mao declares the People's Republic of China, 
He was not declaring an anti-democratic state. He was declaring, in fact, the opposite, a people's power state. When Madison and Jefferson and, and Hamilton and others spoke about democracy in the United States, well, first of all, Madison is very clear. Democracy for him is a form of state organization. That's why he is the great thinker about the separation of powers. Separation of powers between who and what? It's not separation of powers. Well, the people are separated from power, but separation of power is the mechanisms of governance, the mechanisms of rule, the mechanisms within the state of accountability that competing sides of a ruling class, a property owning and exploiting class. How do they compromise? How do they arrive at decisions? You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's brilliant, but let's understand what it is. It's not democracy or people's rule. It is a ruling class ruling in the name of the people. And of course, they came to power, be it the French American Revolution, even the English Revolution, they come to power with the support and the energy of the people. They couldn't have defeated the landlords and the church and all of those institutions without the people. So they proclaim democracy. They always tell the people up to this day, we're making our democracy better. We're becoming more inclusive, on and on and on. But it never happens. The Chinese model. Is a model based upon a new theory of the state. A new theory of the state. Which is different from the theories of the state articulated going back to the 18th century by thinkers such as Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, John Locke, Adam Smith, again, James Madison, John Stuart Mill, the great classic writing on bourgeois democracy. And by bourgeois democracy, we mean when state power is in the hand, of a property owning class that begins as manufacturers, bankers, merchants, slave owners, and the like, but morphs over historic time to a 1% rule of finance capital and big tech and the military. That's what we have ended up with. So we call it democracy but in all its essentials, it is an autocracy where the people's voices matter for very, very little. China is different. It is a people's democracy with contradictions and still in the process of evolution. The Chinese state has proven itself capable of withering or, or, or fending off great crises, in particular, like the financial crisis of 2008 and the COVID triggered crisis of 2020, 2021. At the end, the last quarter, the last three months of 2020, the Chinese economy was already coming out of the recession slash depression caused by COVID and its economy grew at 18% and still continues to grow, probably not at that high rate, but it is growing. Where in the West and in particular, the United States, the great threat is the uncertainty of inflation 
and what they call hyper or out of control inflation. The Chinese currency is not threatened with devaluation on a global scale or domestically. Inflation is not an overarching concern. The fact that the Chinese government two years ago announced that extreme poverty, not just poverty, which they had more or less conquered uh, a decade earlier, but extreme poverty had been wiped out. That the Chinese education system, I'm talking about from child infancy to high school and beyond is superior to the United States higher education system. Of course, we spend more and we get less and less bang for our bucks. I mean, you can graduate from the University of Pennsylvania with a major in gender studies and can't get a job. And you don't need a job because you can't do nothing but talk trash. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you can graduate uh, from Temple University with a degree in African-American studies or what they like to call Africology. And what can you do? There's nothing you can do unless the public education system becomes, here we go again, woke. And so you teach that nonsense that you learned uh, in, your, um, in your classes. The American universities have fa are facing a crisis of legitimacy. The masses of people don't believe in them and don't believe them and on and on and on. It's, it's the opposite in China. They, the educated classes are seen as part of the people and capable of contributing to society. The educated classes in the United States are held in contempt by large parts of the American people and are seen as not being able to make a contribution to people's lives. Uh, let me just end on this. This is a huge moment in history. Uh, the ideological struggle is central. The Western ruling class has opted to fight out the struggle over what will be the future of humanity around questions of democracy and their claim that their democracy is superior. Now, well, now while they continue to saber rattle and conduct brinksmanship war games in the South China Sea and in the Taiwan Straits, and while they continue to provoke uh, Russia uh, off the Cr Crimean Peninsula and still, you know, again, resuming war games off the Korean Peninsula. Unless they are suicidal, and I don't rule that out, they do not want war. They do not want war, which would in all likelihood lead to the common destruction of humanity itself. War, even if it did not lead to the worst consequences, would at least exacerbate the already intensifying warming of the globe. So they have to rely upon what they call their soft power. There, and here's where they're in trouble, example uh, of democracy. Their soft power is declining in significance. If the world had a choice between John Coltrane and Duke Ellington, Billie Holiday and Marvin Gaye, would they choose Jay-Z? I think they would choose the former for obvious reasons. If they had a choice between Ibram Kendi and James Baldwin, I think the world's people would choose James Baldwin. The problem is, in matters of values and culture, 
the U.S. people and the African-American people, sadly, are not able to choose. They can't make a proper judgment about what is of value. And many people have never heard the name Duke Ellington or Billie Holiday. They've never heard that name, those names. They don't know that art. And the ruling class is mainly responsible for it. In the soft power ideological struggle, I will predict, and I think Martin Wolf and Nicholas Kristof would agree with me from different angles, different sides, of the ideological struggle. In the soft power struggle, the West is losing. Not only is it losing the world's people, it has lost its own people and will continue to lose. And so the concept of a people's republic will continue to ascend. And as people, and especially the American people, Increasingly, if given the opportunity and if given ideological leadership, we'll see China and its model of democracy, not as an enemy of democracy, but as an ally of the American people and of the American working class. Uh -huh. That's a very important point uh, I, I, that I'm reflecting on the need of, for the American people to see the Chinese model. And uh, as all these op-ed writers are saying, the greatest threat is from uh, within. Uh, I'll bring in some comments. Uh, on a lighter note, Nabila wrote, a number of people said, good morning, <laughs> Nabila wrote, morning, what's this, men's day? <laughs> yeah, 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 sadly it is. No, this is belated Father's Day, Nabil. I guess that's the only way. Our, our sisters had other things going on. They were supposed to be. <laughs> Samir added that this should be called a manal, a men's panel. <laughs> it's this new language. Okay, all right. <laughs> Criticism. Criticism accepted. It's, uh, we knew this was not the way we wanted to appear, but it happens that way sometimes. <laughs> uh, Nabil also added, uh, Tony, yes, uh, live my life out. I try to think like that, but some people are just destined to be involved. French philosopher Henry Bergson talks about the spiritual immune system. <laughs> And she also said that uh, people who hide from the school, boycott free school, are trying to avoid study. Yeah, yeah that's true, Nabila. Or just don't like the free school. You know, they want to be woke and not ideologically clear. That's, you know, I hear you. I hear you, Nabila. Uh, Don DeVore writes, last time Italy was part of the Belt and Road, they got pasta. Why wouldn't they play again? Okay, yeah, something like that. <laughs> At least they can sell pasta, you know. <laughs> uh, Dusty Hines uh, writes, I have heard you mention this Black Agenda report a few times now, Tony. What happened to Glenn Ford over there? I thought you were close with him. What really went down at the top of Black Agenda report? Well, hey, Dusty, you know, I love Glenn Ford. And I consider Glenn a genius and a courageous one, but Glenn is ill and uh, he cannot play the leadership role that he once did, not only in Black Agenda Report, but in the left. Glenn is huge, huge, as um, uh, was uh, with, um, his co-founder, Cruz, as was Bruce. Brilliant men, brilliant. But I, I consider Glenn to be a unique genius and political commentator. He's ill. Uh, and in 
his absence something profound and, and something deep happened. This is not Glenn Ford and Bruce Dixon's Black Agenda Report by long shot. Uh, it, is, it is pretty much irrelevant. Uh, it says nothing, it thinks about nothing, uh, and uh, it, it's preening and, and trying to uh, use uh, social media to create celebrity and so on is, is really, when you think about what, it, what, what Black Agenda Report comes from and how it, it's just such a, um, uh, I don't know how to say, it. it's so disgusting. I mean, it's hard, it's, I mean, Dusty, for me, it's very difficult knowing what was to visit Black Agenda Report these days. Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely on these two issues, as as uh, Doc was pointing out, the uh, position on Ibram Kendi and this whole new school of race relations, whether we call it critical race theory or something else, mm -hmm. and related to that on the whole issue of the Black Lives Matter movement, on both of those issues, I think Black Agenda Report has gone along with the mainstream media's perspective that these are actually two progressive developments. And uh, here we've been discussing how they're quite the opposite. They're very reactionary. In fact, state linked color revolutionary uh, elements. And interestingly, as we mentioned, discussed a, li a little last week, people around the world are starting to agree with what we're saying, particularly if you look at the remarks of Vladimir Putin at the Biden Putin summit. He also basically described uh, Black Lives Matter movement as something akin to a movement, a color revolution, in other words, a movement there to spread chaos, um, to fulfill the political needs of the ruling class when he implicitly compared it to uh, the, the so-called dissidents that the West is supporting mm -hmm. in Russia, so particularly Alexei Navalny. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, Doc's the presentation also made me think of an article which I had read uh, which came out recently in monthly review entitled The Copenhagen Summit for Democracy, The New Nazis by <laughs> Christopher C. Black, who is an international uh, lawyer who is involved in the tribunal, defending uh, people in the tribunals in uh, Yugoslavia and so on. But he, he, had, he said something interesting on this topic of, well, this summit which was held, it's, uh, it's supposed to consolidate this new... Alliance for Democracy, and very much as Doc said, it's this is the West ideologically trying to uh, put democracy as the terrain on which they want to engage in battle uh, with their enemies. So uh, it, it was presided over by Rasmussen, who's the former Secretary General of NATO. And so in this art, I just wanted to read two paragraphs in this article. At the opening of the conference, Rasmussen the former Secretary General of NATO, once again claimed that the United States led the, quote, democracies against authoritarianism without defining what the latter word means. What government is not an authority? What <laughs> government does not have laws and mechanisms of government that the citizens are to follow and obey? Is the American police state, the state in which three people are killed by the police every day, not an, quote, authoritarian state? <laughs> a state in which only two parties with almost no difference between them are allowed to, uh, allowed to vie for power and in which the media are completely controlled by the secret services and they're linked to the corporate powers that control the government, not authoritarian. And are not the socialist democracies of China, of Cuba, Vietnam, Venezuela, and the capitalist democracies of Russia and other nations unwilling to bend to the will of the USA, also democracies? Of course they are, and the socialist democracies provide the people with more ability to have a say in government decisions than our parliamentary style democracies. So we understand that Rasmussen is misusing language to fool people so that they cannot see behind the veil and realize that he represents the powers of capital that want to control the world and by democracy, he really means the free flow of Western capital, 
And by authoritarian, he means any nation that refuses to be controlled by Western <laughs> capital. And uh, in this later in this article, he also discussed to some extent discusses how the war at home, the repression within the United States against, uh, particularly against the supporters of Donald Trump is very much linked to the summit because one of the themes of the summit was also controlling global disinformation, uh, which in other words is about controlling uh, alternative information or education or dissident views, which people can express uh, on uh, big tech platforms and so on. So this is, this is very much in line, uh, what we're talking about today is very much in line with what is happening uh, in the world. I just, uh, just uh, there's an article on Substack by Glenn Greenwald, uh, who I recommend reading uh, every week if you can. And he says, he asked a question about Mealy, Millie, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, you know, talk, defending his reading of uh, uh, anti, anti white supremacy literature and recommending that reading list for the whole military. He said, I mean, you, you have to ask a question. I mean, this guy, I mean, I, I know, you know, Saul on the road to Damascus became Paul. I won't get into Christian uh, the, uh, theocracy, uh, theology, not theocracy. Uh, but <laughs> that was a quick wait, awakening. I mean, that was quick, fast, and in a hurry. And the CIA overnight becoming pro-transgender and LGBTQ and anti-white supremacy. Well, what? I mean, you know, look, like I often say, I have to pick myself up off the floor from laughing. It's a joke, but why? What is the function of anti-white supremacy at this time from the ruling elite? Well, like Glenn Greenwald points out, it's not rocket science, it's very obvious. It is part and parcel of the ideological political mechanisms of the fight against the people who voted for Trump and who are angry as hell and could disrupt, quote, our democracy, better understood as the rule of the 1%. That is why this is the new ideological cover the new propaganda cover. And sadly, I, ha I hate to tell Mealy and Mealy Mouth, but to tell him and, and the CIA, it ain't gonna work. It's too late. You know, sometimes it's just too late. You all were too arrogant. You were too arrogant to listen. Martin Luther King asked, where do we go from here? Community of chaos, the ruling class. I lived through it, you guys didn't. The ruling class chose chaos for its own selfish reasons. It's too late. The game is over. The Chinese infrastructure is way ahead and superior to the American infrastructure. Go to downtown Philadelphia in the subway station, in the heart of the city. It smells like urine, trash all over the place. What is this? And they're gonna talk about infrastructure. It's too late. And so the people must find a way out. That's the thing, that's our message. Uh, some more comments. Uh, Alish Klein writes, even the students are starting to not believe in the universities. Yeah. I've heard many soon to be graduates anxiously share that they are worried about their lack of real skills mm -hmm. and don't know if they're able to do anything that someone would pay for. Many of these recent grads become really sad knowing that one of the only skills they've honed is alienating people. <laughs> Say it again, Joe. He said one of the many, many of these recent grads become sad knowing that one of the only skills they've honed is alienating people. With clarity, I think they could bring about real change to the university system. Uh, Don DeBar writes, from Nellie Bailey, 
your assessment of Black Agenda Report is absolutely correct. After the death of Bruce Dixon and the decline in health of Glenn Ford, a new influence has emerged. It is not the same bar. It's one of the great casualties of the 2020 election and the capitulation to the 1% under the guise of fighting fascism. They fell for it. And the 1619 Project and the counter-revolution of 1776 and settler colonialism. And I mean, all of the buzzwords and all of the so-called new theories, the Garveyites and all of that, they fell for. They put up no opposition ideologically and would not allow an opposition voice to be heard. Wouldn't allow it. And so I hold them responsible. I hold them responsible. That was a great achievement under Bruce and, and Glenn. But what it is now, you explain to me how it ends up like this. How? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> Doc, I really liked your presentation today. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I, I liked your presentation today. Um, and I, even to start from the beginning, um, I thought that, you know, there's certain questions that you have to get right and that we, like, we the people, to take the constitutional language, have to get right um, in order to be a free, you have this quote, freedom, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's interesting, uh, FDR in his, in his, I guess it was the 1944 fireside chat, you know, when he was talking about the second um, economic uh, or second bill of rights, uh, he, in part of it was, you know, said, he, he said, necessitous men um, are not free. And I want to come back to that. Mm -hmm. Um, but so there's, there's different questions. I mean, even off of, off of that basis, you know, um, the Soviet union, um, was promoting peace, land, and bread, for example. Um, Martin Luther King, uh, was promoting nonviolence, you know, economic justice. He was promoting, um, uh, uh, the a war on poverty, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, anti-imperialist, anti uh, you know, beyond Vietnam and uh, promoting this, this peaceful coexistence um, with different states or with, you know, with, with, with different uh, forms of governance. Um, and uh, so there's, so if you, so, okay, so the ruling class chose chaos, as you said, you know, so they got, so they, so they're already wrong on King, you know, so, you know, you can't, they, so, so clearly the ruling class is not, a, this is clear as day, not aligned um, uh, with the, the values of King and they're not aligned with the values of the Soviet Union, peaceful coexistence, you know, world peace. That's right, that's right. That's right. Um, and I think what's so interesting is that uh, the, uh, the ruling class, you know, for three years uh, 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 spent uh, its uh, ideological uh, re resources, you know, in the form of media, um, in the form of social media, in the form of, uh, and I say media in two forms, I would say in um, uh, a corporate news, you know, as, as we like to think about it, fake news, um, and in the form of uh, its, uh, its, its television, its movies, um, and its culture. Mm -hmm. uh, three, well, four years, really, but I think about three years because of the anti-Russia. They spent three years um, uh, uh, t saying to the world, okay, Donald Trump is not a legitimate president. Um, now, is Donald Trump the, the, the uh, <laughs> revolutionary hero of, of America? No, you know, I, you can't go that far. He's a great disruption as we like to think about it. Um, but I think uh, what's, what's, what, I'm, what I'm kind of drawing out here is that, so if you get this question wrong, if you side with the ruling class, you know, you can't side uh, with the interests and what Donald Trump represents. You know, um, Donald Trump represents this need, this need for jobs. You know, Butler, Pennsylvania, you know, 60,000 people you know, coming out, you know, the, the will of 60,000 people, you know, wanting jobs, wanting, wanting not to go to war. Uh, Donald Trump met with uh, Kim Jong-un. He met with um, uh, 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 Xi Jinping. He met with Putin. So you're, so um, in aligning, aligning with the ruling class, you're aligning against, you know, even the conversation even, you know, even a type of peaceful coexistence, you know, so you're getting the Trump question. So if you get the Trump question wrong, um, you're uh, aligning with the ruling class and aligning yourself against, you know, what, what a, a means toward progress, 
Um, and I bring this up uh, because of how, you know, because of this, you, at the beginning of your uh, 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 presentation today, uh, you talked about wokeness versus ideological clarity. And wokeness, this wokeness thing, uh, is a huge ideological current, you know, uh, you know, within it, having many little different currents, um, little different, you know, if it was a, if it was a huge sea to have many different little rivers going inland, you know, um, and uh, so in aligning yourself with uh, 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 the ruling class and aligning, you know, there were, well, I'm sorry, actually, to, to kind of go about it during uh, last year, uh, uh, I think it was interesting how the free school kind of de or developed, so to speak. Um, there was these during the, both the Black Lives Matter um, uh, move, movement. Um, there were all there was these all these different ideological uh, sort of streams that began to come out. Uh, once again, you know, uh, Ibram, Ibram Kendi comes out with anti-racism. Um, Isabella Wilkerson uh, comes out with cast, you know, D'Angelo. Uh, comes out with uh, white fragility, right? Um, and all these, there's all these different ideological trends. Um, and it's interesting because all of the ideological trends, they, they don't even need to read the whole book. You can hear, all you need is the, the even even the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the title, uh, how to be an anti-racist. Okay, I'm trying to be an anti-racist, you know, um, or oh, settler colonialism. You don't need the whole book. You just need that, you just need that one idea. Um, and, Oh my God, what this? I think it's so uh, critical because you can't, we can't have, and this is what's happening. You can't have a, an imagination of the possibilities uh, of civilization if you've already decided, and if you already sided with the ruling class and you decided that these, these ideas are correct. And see, I feel, this is what I've noticed in conversation um, with different people about Donald Trump or different people about the so or Soviet Union, different people about China, you know, uh, recently I was talking to a, a me and Emil were talking to a friend of or a friend of ours, and um, he had brought up, you know, because the 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 woman, you know, they go by the they them whatever. She had said, um, you know, that it was a uh, you know, or she she wanted to get into AI into the, the you know the 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 get basically the the great reset type of AI, you know, that would you know help people fully escape from reality. Um, which doesn't help any or doesn't solve any problems. It's no problem. Uh, or it is a problem, actually, um, to take that sort of st side. But Emil brought up the fact that, um, you know, China, uh, you know, has this huge technology or this huge technology uplift kind of paraphrase. Um, and the first thing out of her mouth um, was, you know, China's on some weirdo S. I won't, I won't swear. Because <laughs> uh, um, and I think what's so interesting, I mean, first of all, you know, your minds, and this is what's happening, I think, um, in uh, amongst with young people and with uh, uh, people. Well, I say I would say young leftists or, or young people generally. Um, I would say liberals. I would say um, s certainly. How can I? Uh, I think uh, black people that voted for Joe Biden. You know, I think they're or you know, <clears throat> I think at a you know the the mind. And the mindset, because of this constant ideological barrage, you know, in the in whatever form it comes, it can kind of slide in. However, in this constant ideological barrage, you know, has has formed this sort of ideological structure within one's mind. You know, and it's, it's interesting. Donny Hathaway has a song. You know, you you built a um, uh, a castle within my mind. You know, I'm 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 home anywhere, anytime. You know, and it's similar. It's similar. You know, that's what he says. That's what love does. You know, it's very similar. Um, uh, the, this, uh, these ideological currents, um, they they uh, create this this house for people to live in and for people to think. And that's the ideological framework. That's the power of ideas. You know, ideas that don't they don't ever stop. You know, um, and I think that's that's something that we have to understand um, because there's because it's like. You could say gun violence is happening, and you can say it's black. You know, young black men's fault, but then. It's, but then Ideas are driving that. Okay, why? You know, and that's where and that's where change happens in in the ideas. But I say that parenthetically. Um, so the since so what I've noticed is that the 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 mind is already made up. Um, and I think this and this 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 stems from this ideological barrage. Um, and I the reason why I bring this up. Let me see if I can. Um, the reason why I bring this up is because you can't deal or interact like like what just happened with that in that example that I gave 
Um, you can't deal, you can't think about a possibility of China if your life is already determined. And, and I say life was already determined because you can't deal or, or, or if your life is, are, if, you, if you've already thought through everything or, or if your thinking has been done for you, which is the, which it has been what's happening ideologically with this idea of settler colonialism or with the you know, ideas of the ruling class, if your thinking is already done for you, your, your, your life has already been planned in a lot of ways. You know, uh, you know, they say, you know, they say the West is unplanned, but this is this is not true. This is a this is a fallacy. All every all the machinations, you know, there there are study there are thinking study groups right like the Saturday Free School thinking through how to keep this quote democracy going. You know, so if you're so going back, if your idea lodge or if your your life if you you're, if you if you already have an answer, if you can't consider the question, for example, if you can't um, deal or or with a with the possibilities of life. And if you can't, if, if you if you made up that these ideas are the, you know, the ruling class, if, if you've made that decision, okay, well, I'm anti-Trump, you know, because you're not really anti-Trump, you're pro the ruling class, you know, uh, if you've decided that you, you know, you're pro ruling class, um, then you can't really, you know, you can't really deal in, you've eliminated your own revolutionary potential. Um, but only, and I say that only, be, and I say that in that way, because it's like, uh, you've, because it is ultimately a matter of like, okay, well, can you're the one thinking. You have to rem we have to remember that we're the, the thinking agents uh, of history. Um, and if we don't remember this, then somebody will think for us. Um, and so, you know, so, so going back, you can't you can't really deal with uh, the possibilities of, of China, uh, deal with, you know, uh, the possibilities of uh, or even the possibilities of the Trump movement or the possibilities of the of uh, of, of the white working class. You know the, that revolutionary potential that's there within the working class. There are working class people. You know, um, and let me think. I was like, I think I, I really liked. Um, I really think I, I really think this 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 China thing. I think is very special. You know, um, for example, it, it inspired Huey. You know, we are oxen to be ridden by the people. You know, this is this is that. You know. Is this uh, this possibility that you know a, a, a civiliz under under I mean under which I mean you know your your illustration of this these boxer rebellions but the, the great suffering this opium <laughs> this is where a lot of things are kind of flowing in my mind I didn't know that for example K and A is producing a billion dollars worth of wealth I don't think people know uh, K and A is uh, producing billion dollars worth of wealth um, right 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 in Philadelphia um, but. I do see that you know we have to be able to deal not only with what's happening, but why things are happening. Um, we have to deal with we have to we have to get these questions right. We have to be able to because we cannot we're not going to be able to think if we can't you know or we can't say okay well okay well what is if think for ourselves and really deal with what's happening. You know Donald Trump was not uh, the great enemy of the people uh, that we, we we like to make him out to be, um, and neither is China. Um, let me just and, say Hey, hey, Jake, let me, let me make a suggestion. Yeah. Um, you see, the question is, uh, what was Donald Trump or how did he function? Yeah. The, other, the bigger question is, you know, an assessment of the historical meaning yeah. of what was a rejection of the most powerful elements in the society by tens of millions of people. And if Donald Trump was the symbol of that, so be it. Uh -huh. You know, with Donald Trump, it's no, you know, you just can't t take Donald Trump as a whole. Uh -huh. If he's for peace on the Korean Peninsula, denuclearization, okay. If he's against war with Russia, good. If he's for withdrawal, I mean, this, this is the way we have to go at it. Uh, this, you know, in a lot of cases we have transition and sometimes transition occurs through disruption, where the people say enough is enough. We don't know what the next stage will be, but this is not it. And that's, and that's it. The minimal, uh, a minimal uh, uh, projection of what Donald Trump did. Donald Trump thinks he's the whole thing. We don't, th I don't think that at all. You played a historic function at a particular time. Maybe your time is up. We don't know what comes next. 
right now. We're in a period of uncertainty. Why don't we let uh, Joe see if there's some um, comments. Yeah, and bring in some more comments. Uh, Can I just add quickly? Yeah, sure. Um, I think also going off of what Jake said, um, and also Doc, when you were talking in your presentation about how at this point, the function of the so-called left is to attack the working class. Um, like you really see it playing out in, in particular, like the New York City mayor election. Um, and, you know, I, we've talked about Eric Adams before, you know, Jahan, I feel like was the person who brought him into our collective consciousness. But like, it, I was look, you know, looking at the, even the map of how New York City voted um, in this recent democratic primary for the New York City mayor. Um, it's so, like, it's so unbelievably stark which parts of New York voted for who. Um, you have like all of the Bronx basically voted for Eric Adams, um, all of ungentrified New York, which is primarily like black and brown, also like Eastern Europeans um, voted for Eric Adams. Then um, Catherine Garcia, who I think, I think that the New York Times endorsed, um, captured all of like wealthy Manhattan and then all of gentrified Brooklyn um, went to Maya Wiley, who was endorsed by AOC. And like it really was, I think in a lot of ways, like this election in particular was a referendum um, where you could see, I feel like you could see it as like a kind of referendum on uh, the past year, the George Floyd protests and particularly like these slogans of defund the police, abolish the police um, and how really it was the black and brown working class which turned out against this slogan of defund the police. Um, and against these like so-called progressives like AOC um, and Maya Wiley. And like, it's, it's just really fascinating because you see people who are on the left and all they can do is say, oh, Eric Adams is, I don't know, they call him like a kind of like a, I don't know, like a traditional Democrat or more kind of like establishment Democrat, but really they have no way I feel like they have no way of really analyzing themselves and asking themselves, why is it that we could only really speak to the wealthiest Manhattanites and then all the gentrifiers in Brooklyn? Like what, what's up with that? How is it that we had no, like our, like the past year of the, mo like the greatest protest movement in American history, we found no resonance. Hold on, quote. quote unquote, the greatest protest movement in American history. Um, we found no resonance with the supposed people that we were supposed to be you know, advocating for and protesting for, which is black and brown working class people. Um, and instead of asking those questions about like, why are we, how is it that, you know, as Elise was saying, um, why is it that we alienated those people actually? Um, instead, you're kind of trying to undercut and say like, oh, Eric Adams is like represents the establishment, you know, um, he has like ties with real estate. Like none of that really matters. I think the real question is, yeah, like why, like, and I like the way that you phrase it of, almost it's like, it's too late, you know? Like, it's too late for them to make these like kind of aggressive moves because at this point the people are fed up. They don't believe it. Um, and especially with the fact that, yeah, like this recent, like the past year of this rise of crime um, in places like Philly and New York, every major city, it's like when you go through institutions like these higher, like these Ivy League schools, you're taught to like almost be like, if we talk about crime that makes you a racist, you know, you, there's a, this whole sensitivity about talking about crime because like, it, it's really like, I, like I've had to think about it a lot in the past year, um, but it's like that kind of whole thing where they're so afraid to talk about things, which these are the issues that affect like the most ordinary people, um, like the actual people that you're claiming to represent. And um, yeah, and I feel like it's that connection where you see like what is called the left today is they're primarily aiming to, whether they know it or not, to attack the working class um, and to push agendas which are against the working class um, where you have to ask this question of, even if you're on the left and you claim to be like pro-China, um, what kind of unity are you seeking with China if domestically your whole agenda is pushing against the working class and fight and like basically attacking both the white and now also the black and brown working class and saying that they're backwards because they don't support defund the police, you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, I feel like this is also 
why like you know what we're talking about with china especially this event i think it's so important because like if you take a step back like it's very clear that the ruling class despises both the trump movement as well as china you know and it plays out in different ways but like part of what i feel like we're trying to um to advance with free school is you know it's like let's maybe like let's try to reconsider let's try to build kind of unity between these like what are currently very disparate forces you know um because i think it is true that i feel like the most vocal segments of like the trump movement have no love for china um and many of them see china as an enemy and i feel like i feel like that is the reality at this point but like that being the case like we're still you know trying to push for some kind of even dialogue or discussion um like to try to push for an actual principled unity um, between these different forces in America as well as China. Um, and yeah, and then I think the last thing was like, like recently um, some of us read Fidel's speech, The Battle of Ideas, which he gave in 1999 in Venezuela um, after Hugo Chavez had been elected, I believe. And um, yeah, he just has like all these, this, this beautiful line about how, you know, like the imperialists have, they have invented very intelligent weapons, um, but we, the revolutionaries, have discovered an even more powerful weapon, which is that man thinks and feels. And um, yeah. I don't know, yeah, just like stuff like that, where like so much of what you see on the left today, even though it's like kind of thinly disguised, is this belief that ordinary people can't think and feel for themselves. And instead, you're going to have to shove this like like your own revolutionary agenda down their throats. Um, and the people reject it because they can think and feel. And um, yeah, and I just feel like that's also part of, you know, like how he, like Fidel in that time period after the collapse of the Soviet <coughs> Union was saying, you know, like their needs, the most pressing need right now is for a battle of ideas, for ideological struggle, which, um, yeah, I think it just further reinforces everything that, that you've talked about, Doc, um, and that we've, um, you know, tried to develop with the free school, but yeah, I don't know. I think all of that um, was what came to mind. Could, could I just say something, Joe, just apropos what, um, what Jeremiah just said, you know, you know, when you say most uh, people who voted for Trump see China as the enemy, the operative word is see. Most people are so overwhelmed by the crisis right at their doorstep that they see very little beyond it. And, but to give working people a fighting chance, that's all, let's a fighting chance. We must expand the possibilities of what they see. Seeing is very, very important. If you can see, you can then come to an understanding. That's why the ruling class is always obscuring so much, to make it hard to see. That, that's all I wanted to just say. Forgive me for interrupting. Sure, sure. Before I go to the comments, I also wanted to ask Caleb if he wanted to add anything I haven't heard from yet. Um, I just want to say it was a really wonderful lecture, Doc. Thank you so much for that. I think. Um, I don't know, thinking about Chinese democracy and like the new paradigm of China is, I think something really, I mean, like everyone said is incredibly important now, but it's also, I mean, reflecting now on how, I don't know, it's, it's like this new developing historical consciousness that's being revived in China. And that I think is important to understand fully because I think one of the things with the left now, like with politics now um, is like, it seems very ahistorical and revisionist. I mean, such as the 1619 project, how, left disorganized now, or even just groups who feel like, you know, what we'll do is just take a model from history, how the Black Panthers organized and bring it to today. And that's enough. Like the ideological struggle isn't core to that. It's not understanding what's needed for today, but just taking these frameworks and trying to, you know, shove it into what's happening now in the moment without really understanding reality. And I, I'm gonna have some trouble like framing what exactly this, historical consciousness is, but I think, I think some of the things that I've noticed in like reading some articles on, you know, intellectuals in China talking about the future of China is 
like just how like how consistently they are trying to reckon with you know what is the historical trajectory of China I mean it's inevitable that you see how far China has like risen over the past few years and you know different intellectuals who have different conceptions of what how what direction China should take but I think one of the most interesting things that I've noticed is I mean there's a lot of intellectuals who are talking about you know China is at a point in its civilizational history that like it's time to unify the three traditions that have shaped China uh, the Confucian tradition, the communist tradition, the enlightenment tradition, and what would that mean, you know, for the future of China? And I think that's something that's really lacking in America. Like, where, where do we understand our traditions and where we come from? I mean, a lot of it now is just, you know, we have the most refined theories, critical race theory, gender studies, whatever. I mean, very sophisticated frameworks, but that say basically nothing about the history and the revolutionary history of America. Like, how can you talk about revolution while also, like free schools before deny 1776 and, and the American Revolution? What does it mean to carry revolution forward too? And I think I think what's, what's interesting is like this connection that China has with Afro-America. I mean, true, there's three traditions that China carries from, but what about the Afro-American tradition? I mean, what are the spirit of Bandung and, you know, Paul Robeson singing the national anthem? And then does even Hugh and Newton go into uh, China? Like, where does that tradition fit in within, you know, America and China itself? And it's, yeah, like, I think, I think these historical bridges are like necessary for understanding. I mean, like revolution for today, or even just, you know, how do we understand China? Because it's not like how a lot of leftists have been doing it, just, you know, basically defending China and saying that, you know, no Cold War, and which I think is, you know, a stance that is important to take, but it's not just, you know, defending China on these grounds, but also ignoring, you know, understanding, like an understanding America is understanding China's role for today too. Yeah, that's a great point uh, that you finished on because I definitely agree. I think that the weakness of most of what I've seen uh, in terms of like the efforts by different leftists to, you know, against a new Cold War, this is the, the problem is that they're taking a sectarian stance towards the American people as a whole. It's an attempt to try to uh, defend China within a left bubble or silo. And uh, like Caleb said very well, you have to engage with the American traditions and the possibilities of unity between the progressive traditions of the United States and people of the United States and uh, the Chinese revolution. That's, that will be the strongest bulwark against a new Cold War or against confrontation. It's not just about denouncing the confrontation or denouncing the politics of the government. It has to be I think that's the spirit of Robeson or Du Bois or King is to do it in this way, um, which is, I think, what we're going to attempt to do with our work this year. Um, but we have several comments which I'll bring in. Uh, Nantha writes, the distinction Doc made between a democratic republic and a people's republic is clarifying. One difference between the two is the absence of elections of the kind you see in the U.S., a waste of the people's time and resources. All the money that goes into that complete show would be better spent in government programs of social uplift. It also prevents long-term planning of the economy in places like India, where the ideology and people in charge change every five years. Mm -hmm. Just to remind people, I think the last election, at least the 2016 election, cost over $1 billion. And, you know, it was a horrible drain. And it's not to say that in China, they have various mechanisms for taking in the popular will, but they don't necessarily have these multi-party um, elections, which private capital can spend millions upon millions and billions of dollars to influence. And, you know, one of the things we want to do, hopefully, is study the, Chi the Communist Party of China as a unique political party of over 18 million people. How does it function? What are the mechanisms of debate and disagreement and resolution of contradiction within the party? And why do we have to do it every year with this loud, useless, uh, 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 what do they call circus? Is this democracy or is this obscuring democracy and preventing the rise of people's power? That's, China is very conscious. The leadership is very conscious 
and very intentional about what they're doing. Like Nandatha said, modern societies to develop and grow must be planned, must be planned. And with all of this information technology, we're able better to plan social development, including the education of children and the people. Yeah, and, and to your earlier point also that the Chinese revolution was not just consisting of the Communist Party, had the, Com the Communist Party as the leading party, but a united front. Someone that I uh, met from China pointed out to me that um, actually even today in China, it's governed by a technically united front with the Communist Party as a leading party. Right. And as you were saying, there are many mechanisms uh, through which debate occurs. And one of them, I think it's called the People's uh, Consultative Congress uh, or something like conference. But in that, the various parties of the United Front can present their different opinions and debate policy and so on. And then that goes to like the, com the People's Legislative Assembly or conference. Uh, which is made up of representatives. And so anyway, it's, they, they have, they've developed a very sophisticated system uh, with which to engage in these kinds of debates. They're also including representatives of the trade unions, of peasants, of the youth organizations and other various sectors of society. This is very interesting, Joe. You know, the Chinese talk about socialism, the Chinese characteristics. Well. We're now, what they're talking about also is democracy with Chinese characteristics. I don't like the word Chinese characteristics. I think it is democracy anchored and rooted in our own history and our most immediate history. I mean, people don't have empathy, don't understand the, the century of humiliation. Well, I think we're gonna start understanding a little bit of that here in this country because we're about ready to enter, you know, a century of humiliation of the people. But all of that, the brutality of the Civil War, the brutality of the Japanese occupation. Oh, what, they're supposed to, you know, uh, take power and then, oh, we're gonna have elections in two years. And everybody put, you know, throw your hat into the ring and whoever has the most money will win. No, it doesn't happen like that. And it didn't happen like that here. And it didn't happen like that anywhere. And it does not, and when it happens like that, it's somewhere in a fiction book that somebody wrote, who's not even a good writer. Uh, okay. So then we have uh, Dusty Hines. He writes, uh, okay, what's wrong with the counter-revolution of 1776 as a scholarly historical text Horn seems to me to be pretty sympathetic to communist ideas. Uh, Dusty, did you read the book? That's the first thing. No, it's, it's, it's wrong from so many angles. And it's not just wrong as scholarship, its intention is bad. You know, in boxing, we say, a, you know, boxer throws a kind of certain punch. You say he threw it with bad intentions. Gerald Horn wrote that book with bad intentions. What were his intentions? Was it to uphold the unity of the working class? I can tell you out the gate, no. And Dusty, just read the preface. He says, rather than the call for black and white unite or workers unite, we should call uh, for uh, Africans to unite. Well, that's Neo Garveyism. And if you don't know anything about Garvey, uh, Garvey was an arch counter-revolutionary, anti-working class, uh, and ultimately anti-Black, although he paraded and wore you know, garments and everything to play that, perform that great performer, theoretically backward. Uh, no, the book was written with bad intentions. Uh, there is a critique of it, a worthy critique of it in uh, the World Socialist website. I would suggest you go to that, read that critique. The other thing, check out the fact that uh, very, very few scholars have um, accepted that notion that 1776 was a counter-revolution or that the real nature of the American political economic system is settler colonialism. A hey, Dusty, 
Don't believe the hype. Don't fall for something just because it's promoted by the ruling class or you heard it in some left circle. A uh, comment from Helen Lowry, or I, I should also say to Dusty, if you look back at our, uh, one of our earlier free schools, I think it's entitled, uh, in the title or description, it says that we, were, we went very much into detail about uh, that kind of revolution of 1776 book, as well as the critical review and World Socialist website. Mm -hmm. um, but Helen, Helen uh, Lohri writes, Glenn Ford is a genius. I owe him so much for my understanding of race. I had occasionally noticed others published on Bar who didn't meet that same standard, in my opinion. That would be sad if they took over his legacy. Yeah. History will, she also adds, history will prove that Deng was China's Khrushchev and Xi is China's Gorbachev, both, <laughs> betray <laughs> both betraying Mao and Lenin and Marx's legacies. The Chinese economy is now trickle-down capitalism. Yes, now they are beating the U.S. at its own game, making the same rising tide lifts all ships, similar war on poverty arguments as the U.S. did in the post-World War II era. From a Marxist-Leninist perspective, recent Chinese claims rest on Mao's laurels, but like the U.S. bragging of 40 years ago, these newer claims by Xi are a lie, a shameful capitulation to international bourgeois exploitation of the global working class inside and outside China. It is not a laudable thing for China to be playing the same labor exploitative billionaire manufacturing game as the US and its EU so-called social democratic puppets. Beating the US at its own game is not winning. Refusing to play the game and sticking to Maoism would have been better. No, and can I just respond, Helen, with all due respect, and, and I love the fact that you will not abandon your thesis until you have been convinced otherwise. I would like to suggest this. Uh, as you know, uh, Dung was like that with Mao. They were all on that long march and they loved each other. I mean, both to their dying days. I mean, they were not enemies. They politically differed. And the differences became very deep and very sharp in the leadership of China uh, by the 1960s. Um, and those differences, by the way, and this is, you know, this should humble all of us uh, in our understanding of revolutionary change. The differences reach such an acute and intense level that it almost threatened the uh, power of the people, the dictatorship of the proletariat. And I, I, I think we cannot underestimate that they could have lost it all. Uh, and the importance of Deng Xiaoping uh, was to reconsolidate the state uh, and, and to move forward. Now, two uh, philosophies, approaches to the transition to socialism in China. Uh, Mao felt that you could leap over stages, that you could go from deep poverty to socialism, and in fact, to communism. And he was, um, and I'm, I'm still trying to understand uh, his, um, his mind because it, <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't want to be misunderstood, uh, but his slogans, et cetera, sounded better here in the United States among leftists and revolutionaries than they did in China because everyone knew that first and foremost, China had to build up what we call the material and technical basis to move to advanced socialism. You can't build socialism in abject poverty. Everyone knows that. Uh, the North Koreans know it, the Cubans know it, Everyone knows it. And then the other thing is you can't build advanced socialism on slogans. There has to be a plan and a realistic plan. And Mao felt you could throw all of that out of the window. I feel, and you might disagree with me. What has been happening over the last 
40 years, we're talking about 40 years now, is the laying of the material, technological, and in fact, ideological conditions for the building of socialism. To get to that stage because of the enormous destruction that China had experienced for over a century and a half, uh, it took some time. Uh, 70 years in China's history is a very, very short time compared to its 5,000 year history. And too often we in the West are overly impatient about other people's revolution and don't feel what King called the fierce urgency of now about our own. Uh, I can, I can roll, you know, I, I feel you and I look really, Helen, I really look forward to meeting you and sharing this back and forth. I feel that Xi Jinping uh, has in fact, and this is the question of state power, whatever the economic mechanisms that are used, the Chinese revolutionaries could not give up state power. That is the key. You know what I'm saying? Uh, socialism, like Bernie Sanders, AOC, or even the Norwegian or whatever versions, with state power still in the hands of the capitalist class, is a hollow victory. They had to hold on to state power. They almost lost it. It was already fragile at the beginning of the revolution. They hadn't consolidated in October, 1949. They hadn't. They had made gains throughout the 50s, you know, in feeding people, in the different experiments, in, in collectivizing agriculture, et cetera. But they were moving towards consolidation. But the great cultural revolution, it was, I don't know how they survived it. They could have lost everything. And I think Deng Xiaoping's contribution is the reconsolidation of state power in the beginning of the process by economic and ideological means of winning back the Chinese people. Because the Chinese people were exhausted. There, there was a lot of pessimism, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, you know, I did fuck the communists, they fucked up, all that type of thing. But what we see today, and it's only been 70 years, and really only 40 in this period, coupling with the West, decoupling, and now creating a whole different international system to compete with the system imposed upon the world by the United States and the West after World War II. We call it the Bretton Woods system. They're creating a whole alternative system. Is it more democratic? Yes, for nations. Is it an obstacle to neocolonial? Yes, it is. And um, yeah, I think that's the record. I think, is it perfect? Not yet. And anybody that wants to nitpick you know, about its lack of perfection. Well, what is your contribution? What would you do? You give me a plan that would work better than this one. Yeah, I, I would also just add, uh, you know, uh, I, I like the point that Helen made about the importance of history. I mean, obviously we cannot yet say what history will say about this era of uh, China, but we can s talk about history uh, as far as revolution in the 20th century and the past of socialism go. Um, of course, in the 20th century, we saw many great revolutions and the starting with the Russian revolution, but including many of the Cuban revolution, Chinese revolution, uh, great uh, attempts at building socialism. Uh, we could talk about the Soviet Union. We can mention countries like Albania as well, different uh, kinds of ideologies which developed that have their own perspectives on Marxism, Len uh, Leninism. There's the Soviet one, but there's the Albanians, there's the Chinese. Uh, but 
we we see through history that although all may have done uh, very courageous attempts at building socialism, few have survived the onslaught of Western imperialism and uh, all these factors. So we really have to take seriously the communist parties that have stayed in power, uh, which is basically about, I think, three or four, China, Cuba, Vietnam, Laos, and uh, North Korea, what's known as North Korea. And uh, so, and, and the achievements which they've made, and definitely China has made great achievements, especially taking into account that it's such a gigantic uh, country. And, uh, you know, if it really was the case that they're simply interested in uh, being like the Western model of economics, then we would see them move towards that. I mean, you, you saw actually in some ways something that mirrors the long march and maybe you could say a strategic retreat in terms of political economy, the uh, opening up of the markets. But then why would they would just go all the way? They would say, OK, like it doesn't benefit the Chinese bourgeoisie to, to have the Communist Party there after a certain point, uh, they want to own all the wealth, they want to control all the companies, and they, and they want control over the financial system. But those things they can't have while there's still the uh, Communist Party in power. Um, and in fact, I mean, most, that's why the, most of the Western media is so critical, because they don't see what they call political liberalization in China. And uh, in fact, I think the equivalent of Gorbachev and China is actually a figure who, I mean, I have trouble with Chinese names, but I think his name is, maybe Caleb can help me. His name was Zhao, Zhao Jiang, who was the uh, general secretary of the Communist Party from 1987 to 89, when Deng Zhao was the paramount leader. And during the Tiananmen uh, protests of students, he actually went this uh, Jiang uh, or Zhang, I think his name is pronounced, Jiao went to the demonstrators and he said, "Like you're right, we're too old, we're irrelevant, we need to change, we need to adopt multi-party democracy, we need to liberalize, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. But the thing is, uh, Dong and his colleagues moved against him with quickness. With, with quickness. <laughs> with <the> quickness. <laughs> <laughs> they purged him and kept him under house arrest the rest of his life until he died in like 2000s. Gotcha. <laughs> and his book, his the, the reason that we actually know about him is because his memoirs were written, uh, which he called entitled Prisoner of the State and smuggled out of China somehow and published in the West, translated into English and published in the West. And so to this day, the academic and other experts on China and the West. Like if only Zhao had come to power, Zhao was the only hope for democracy in China, et cetera. So anyway, I think that context helps us to see that history, the direction that history is taking in China. And it's, I don't think that this evidence points to the fact that it's moving in the direction of the Western uh, economic or political uh, model. And in fact, we have to see beyond just economic, we see the politics also you know, together. Uh, so, and, and of course, not to mention uh, that China is actually giving uh, economic and in some cases even diplomatic support to the other anti-imperialist countries like Venezuela, Iran, Syria, uh, among many others. But to kind of yeah. also to briefly kind of respond to Helen's point, I think it's interesting what Doc had said earlier, you know, uh, democracy under, or, history used by or uh, under democracy, so to speak, or, or, or I forgot how quite how you put it. Um, again, Jake, say one you, you had said something along the lines of, uh, you know, like socialism, you, you didn't like you say you didn't like uh, uh, the word uh, uh, socialism, socialism under, with, with China's characteristics. Exactly, exactly. It's socialism and the historical moment. Yeah, and um, this, and I, socialism but, grounded in the struggle and civilization of China. It is a specific specificity. Yeah, you know, and I agree with them about that. Yeah, and and I I think that's the only thing I think I would suggest to uh, Helen, um, because I think it's easy to get caught up in in okay, well Mao, Lenin, and but what's the historical moment uh, that we're living in, and what what's the historical what has China achieved? I mean, this poverty this extreme poverty alleviation. Um, does seem to be, I mean, does adhere to socialism and does adhere to the historical problem that China is facing right now. Um, 
And that, I think I would say that, that would be my suggestion to, or to, or to think about how, or like what's, or like, okay, the moment, what does the moment call for us to do? Um, yeah, okay, yeah, no, that's true. See, the question is not just theory, but practice, you know, and what were the conditions of China in uh, 19, uh, uh, 1979 when Deng Xiaoping comes to power? Of course, we say Deng Xiaoping coming to power. We're talking about a whole new direction within the Communist Party of China. Uh, that didn't mean that everybody agreed, because there were people at that time that still agreed with the Cultural Revolution. And there were people who fervently disagreed with it and said, it brought us to the edge of destruction. You know, they, they I mean, they, they very barely escaped the bullet. We now know. So, so we have to have, and this is the thing, you have to have a practical understanding. And what happened in the Soviet Union is not going to happen in China. You know, we learn from each other, but it's not the same thing. And you cannot build socialism on slogans, and you cannot build socialism without raising the material conditions of production and ultimately winning the people to what I'm calling the state of the whole people. I think they have both conditions. I would challenge Helen to answer the question, are they closer to realizing socialism? And I would say advanced socialism today than they were, let us say, in 1960 or 1966. I would say they're closer. And I think they have, well, anyway, I'll stop there, you know. I, I, the only thing I would add is that if we were like adhering, I think strictly if, okay, so we, say we were strictly Maoists, we would toe the line of uh, uh, the cultural revolution, you know, know which is unaffordable to. They, they couldn't do it. They could, it would, I'm sad, I mean, I'm just sad to say mm -hmm. the great genius of Mao Zedong ceased to be that when it came to the practical problems they faced in the 50s and 60s. It often happened. It often happens, you know, nobody is perfect. Nobody is beyond critique and criticism. You know what I'm saying? So thank God, you know, whoever your God is or not, that, that they were able to hold on to state power. I think like Joe said, the reason the West is so upset is that they did not relinquish state power. And what Xi and this leadership is saying is we ain't hardly thinking about giving up state power for your, quote, so-called democracy. We're not going to play the game that way. And that is key. Gorbachev, on the other hand, gave up state power. I mean, literally destroyed Soviet power, he and Yeltsin. I mean, that, that is, those are the contrasts. They're not the same. Xi is not Gorbachev. I mean, if you understand Gorbachev, an agent of Western intelligence, I'm telling you, Helen, they're not the same. We can look at a whole series of decisions. They're not the same. I mean, that's precisely what needs to happen. Let me, let me just read Ellen, Helen's response. Uh, she writes, uh, yes, we can critique the pros and cons of Maoism. I am not a Maoist, so it is strange to find myself defending it. Regarding leaping over stages, Mao was comparable to Trotsky in that respect. As for solutions, in my opinion, Soviets had an even better system. But for the sake of the earth, my take is that humans need to separate industrialism from socialism. We will need more exploration in the direction of what Engels had called primitive communism. Uh, well, well, <laughs> I don't know about primitive communism, if we can go back to primitive communism. Uh, primitive meaning primary, the earliest forms of communal life. Uh, I think the values of early communalism can inform our moving forward especially as it relates to the man nature or human nature, humans and nature relationship. And indeed, 
if climate change, and this is to Dusty Hines, and I agree with you, Dusty, we talked about this. If this uh, climate crisis is to be resolved, we have a better chance under the state of the whole people and China than we do under this mess we got in this country. See, one of the things about this, and, and Helen, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I look forward to meeting you, really, you don't know. But uh, one of the things that defines this kind of bourgeois democracy is its profound hypocrisy and talk. They, they do a lot of talking and nothing gets implemented. And so when students graduate from elite universities, I can't do nothing but talk. I'm not even a good reader. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very adept at, at talking, running off at the mouth. But to carry out a vast transformation of production on a world scale, you need the state and the state of the whole people, not the dictatorship of a tiny elite, a la what we have in the West. Uh, before we we have a lot of other comments to get to yeah, the, yeah. get to them, I just wanted to say uh, also briefly that uh, uh, on this point, yeah, I definitely think that the point of the values is very important. Perhaps in parallel to what Marx was saying, with primitive or primary communism, what like talk about with Du Bois and King, the values, civilization, mm -hmm. and I think we can have much more confidence that the Chinese state of the whole people reflects the values of China's okay. civilization, which uh, actually, I mean, if you read whatever little I've read of Confucian poetry, it's like 90% of it is about nature <laughs> and decent, you know, man being small in relationship to nature and all that stuff. So, uh, and even their art is like that, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. so, but the point is that if you read about recent things, decisions made by the communist party in the past decade or so, they added the concept of what they call ecological civilization to their constitution. Really? Uh, yeah, there's an interesting book about it uh, called China and Ecological Civilization by Andre Balchik. But anyway, he talks about how they added that, which means that when they, calc when they make their targets for GDP and growth, they have to factor in the environmental cost of things. And then also that has meant reversing the really being, I think, the first large country in the third world to reverse the urban to rural migration to make it more people leaving the urban areas to go to the rural areas to set up, you know, modern villages and farming communities and agriculture. So that, all that is just to say that they, I think that they are dealing with these questions much better than we can hope for this, you know, kind of exhausted imperialist political model to uh, deal with any of these questions. Uh, but that being said, bring in some more comments. Uh, Vincent writes, General uh, Meek Millie, I guess he's doing a pun, <laughs> General Meek <laughs> Millie, uh, doesn't realize that he's further alienating the very people he considers the biggest threat to the nation with his comments on identity politics. He will now be seen as even more of an enemy of the people than he was already and a joke, more of a joke than he's been seen as in the past, by the way. Right. Uh, Emily writes, a speech that I like from Xi Jinping is called governing a big country is as delicate as frying a small fish from 2013. I like it because it reminds me of what Du Bois said in Russia and America about democracy in the Soviet Union, where the Soviets spend less time arguing about progressive platforms, but instead have already understood as a society that all economic, political, social planning will be along the lines of principles, along the principles of of and for the people. Instead, they spend time deciding who will best execute the principles of the people. In this Xi Jinping speech, he talks about how the strength of carefully governing and planning for such a large country like China depends on the cadre you develop in the CPC. For example, all party officials like uh, Xi must begin at the local level, not just to gain experience governing, but to have experience listening to and understanding the concrete concerns of a specific area's people. This kind of democracy focuses on the leaders developed who can reflect the needs of the people rather than arguing about progressive agendas promised but never kept. Compare this to Western democracy where you can elect a state representative who just graduated college and has no experience governing 
let alone experience living with and listening to the people. Uh, Purba writes, Du Bois in the essay of the ruling of men after defining democracy as the method for realizing the broadest measure of justice for all asks, quote, if millionaires can buy science and art, cannot the democratic state outbid them not only with money, but with the vast ideal of the common wheel? Whoa. If a democratic state is to be judged by its attitude towards the rich in a country where the masses of, are poor, China is infinitely more democratic than is the US. Emil writes, what truly galvanized the Trump movement were his stances against deindustrialization, endless wars and fake news. These forces were correctly identified by Trump voters as critical attacks upon working people. Uh, Do Byun writes, this discussion has been very enlightening for me. We've talked about the crises of the West for a long time, but today's example of the military trying to be woke and against white supremacy showed me the depth of the crisis of the ruling class. That the military is trying to change their image by being for trans people and for black people shows there is a major crisis in the state's legitimacy. And to add on to Jake, one's stance on the queer issue also affects one's stance on China, Russia, and the nations with an anti-colonial tradition. If one is for quote, queer liberation and uses non-binary pronouns, they're in effect still seeing America as the model democratic nation accepting of queer identities and dismissing the democracies of China and others. And even worse for quote, radicals who might be critical of America to begin with, this queer stuff further blinds them from seeing any possibility of a way out because there is no tradition or ideals to look to. Uh, Don Dubar writes, in order to install or instill false consciousness, it is first necessary to interdict the information flow required to feed true consciousness. Uh, Todd Doherty writes, Christopher C. Black's, that's that piece I was reading from Monthly Review, piece is made part is made for the Saturday Free School. Oh, he actually tagged Christopher C. Black on Facebook. Maybe he'll see our stream, the guy who, the author of that piece. Say that one, one more time. I couldn't quite understand last uh, time. Todd Doherty wrote, Christopher C. Black's recent piece is made for the Saturday Free School. But what did you say? I didn't quite understand. Uh, I said he, he, he tagged Christopher C. Black in that comment, the author of that piece. So maybe he'll see our live stream. Oh. Uh, Purba writes, I agree with Nandita fully and uh, with liberal democracy as the popular religion today, I seem to be on India as the largest democracy of a colonized people. The idea seems to be if it works in India, it can work anywhere. But do we really want the US model of democracy to work in India or should we look, be looking towards China? The former has condemned half her people, the poor working class, and is bowing to money and making war. The latter reports successful eradication of extreme poverty, is cracking down on big business, and is undertaking a massive project for global infrastructure development. Well, you know, uh, just when you take India, the uh, overturning of Indian socialism, the question is not, India having elections. The real question, and this is why Indira Gandhi was so important and is still so important. The question is, are, is there a constituency for Indian socialism, for a planned economy? Has that been destroyed? Has the political consensus for that been destroyed? And if so, I don't think they can hold India together. I don't think they can. Because, and then the other thing is, you know, the Gandhian Nehru idea of a state of the whole people. That's what they were talking about with or without all of these elections, the state of the people or what some would like to call the civilization state. The civ Let me just explain civilization state, the state based upon the historical values of a people, their languages, their culture, their music. That's the civilization where you don't import as some Indian intellectuals wanna do. You import 
Western values, in particular British and American values, you import that and their politics into a country that has a totally different civilization history. You know what I'm saying? And I hope the Indians don't go down that road. Please, India, don't commit suicide, national suicide, uh, trying to win the approval of the white West. It'd be sad. Yeah, I was watching a, um, a video with uh, intellectual Zhang Weiwei recently, um, an interview with him on CGTN. He was saying that, you know, like for China at this point, like you're, there's not even a consideration of the question of like, oh, should we move towards Western style liberal democracy? Like that question has long since passed. Yeah. And um, yeah, because he was saying that, I think you talked about this um, during your initial presentation, Doc, but that China has already experimented with liberal Western democracy before. And the result was basically being colonized by Japan. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it's like, if we've already tried, like people don't, I feel like people in the West don't realize that China has already experimented with many forms of um, political government governance. And so, um, yeah, for them, it's like, the question is, it's not even relevant anymore. It's more about how will the Chinese state continue to innovate um, and to develop itself and reform itself on its own terms. Yeah, I think there's a serious question that's going to be facing every Asian and African uh, society and nation. Uh, what, how will they respond to this great, uh, we could say battle over democracy, which is being uh, imposed uh, by the West. And uh, of course, it's it's a very up it's a difficult battle because of the information warfare as well, uh, the Western control, the big tech um, control, which I mean, a lot of the third world is very plugged into big tech now. China and Russia have been, have successfully created their own uh, social media platforms also, so that they can control a lot of this. But much of the rest of the world is very embedded with Facebook and Twitter. But in addition to that, the, main, the major media corporations and entities in the rest of the world uh, being highly controlled by Western capital. Um, and then of course the universities as well. And uh, even many of the uh, basically bureaucrats, senior bureaucrats and strategic thinkers uh, are, you know, they get very plush jobs either in American strategic think tanks or you know, university centers and institutes where they're also indoctrinated and in many ways even bribed with this privileged access and convinced about all these things about democracy and being opposed to um, China. And uh, also the thing is, uh, the other question is, what uh, shape will this uh, kind of anti, the extension of the anti-colonial movement take today? Um, because we know what it looked like in the 1950s and 60s, and we know many of the important figures. But uh, today, we don't, I mean, it may look, it, and it is so far looking very different. I mean, for example, in that era, Bandung era, most of the leaders were very kind of cosmopolitan. In some ways, you could say elites, although they tried, they sided with the people where they came from elite backgrounds, but they're very uh, familiar with the West and like, you know, erudite and English and so on. But uh, now you have, for example, uh, you have a lot of forces which are basically very socially conservative, but anti-imperialist and anti-neoliberalism. Like that's what you're seeing, for example, in Iran with this recent election, but also with the Houthi movement in Yemen, with the Hezbollah movement in Lebanon. Um, similarly, even some of the uh, things that have happened in Latin America, it's been people who've tried to merge the religion of the masses with like liberation theology and, um, you know, patriotism. So yeah, it's just, this is the thing, this is a big question is what will, obviously we, we, it's difficult to say that things in the past will be repeated again, but now you have this China, Russia alliance, they're making more further allies with countries like Iran, Venezuela. Um, you have organizations like, for example, this week, there was a summit of an organization called the SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, marking its 
uh, 20 years in existence. And it's not very much talked about in the Western media, but it includes like half of the world's population. And uh, it, I think it has two permanent members of the UN Security Council, which are Russia and China, but also four nuclear armed countries, which are Russia, China, India, and Pakistan as uh, members. So new institutions like this also, of course, present new opportunities. Uh, but again, this battle, this, I think that this attempt to wage democracy in this, this kind of way, the attempt to split these kinds of uh, institutions and to basically argue that democracy has to be Western, has to be something comfortable to, you know, bourgeois liberal characteristics, has to be plugged into the Western think tanks and universities. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, this, this is, this is the, the great uh, question. And, you know, you were mentioning the 50s and 60s, and, and these were actually battles within the elites. Uh, and in every country, there were pro-Western and non-pro-Western uh, elites. And, you know, and what we saw, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and with the collapse of the Soviet Union, that pro-Western elites won out, of course, with the support of the West, the soft and hard power support. So in China, and I think it was, I, I think you said it, Jeremiah, um, that battle has more or less been won. Although there are many pro-Western intellectuals within China, and there's a website that Caleb uh, alerted me to that I've read, and you can read neoconservative, neoliberal, Chinese intellectuals in universities and think tanks. But for the most part, that battle has been won. In India, it was lost for the time being. Uh, in other, well, one of the problems in the African continent as a whole is this battle between uh, uh, indigenous or uh, development with African characteristics versus the pro-Western and Western educated elites. And the Western educated elites are a problem wherever you go, be it China, India, Africa, or wherever, we see it in this country. Once they start letting black people into the elite universities, we're doing worse now than we ever did. I mean, the, let me just put it this way. The elite educated, um, the elite university educated elites are poisonous to the unity and struggle of black folk. They have contributed nothing for the most part to our advance. Uh, Helen Laurie's uh, coming back into that uh, discussion saying, Deng and Xi left the CCP labels intact on the door of the Chinese state. Gorbachev handed the keys of the building to a Western puppet, Yeltsin, who let the U.S. in to control the economy and change the names on the door. Putin kicked the U.S. out, but communism is no more. But China did let billionaires in to change their economy. Every U.S. corporation has been there profiteering. They just left the CCP name on the door. This could be confusing to Westerners. The MAGA hats blame communists in name only for everything. And the Western liberals cheerlead communists in name only for their rising billionaire GDP economic coattails effect on the poor. This effect will be stopping unless Chinese billionaires can hegemon Belt and Road international development attempts. Belt and Road is as imperialist as 20th century Western international investments in the third world. I tend to disagree, Helen. We'll go over that another time. <laughs> Right. Yeah. I mean, this is obviously an ongoing discussion. I would again add like the, the hostility, not just from the West, but from the oligarchs within China towards the yeah. uh, party and particularly towards the turn it's taken with Xi Jinping. The question is, do they have state power? Right. No. <laughs> they don't have state power. Were they unleashed in the throes of a country that needed capital and innovation and they were pro-West, there's no question. They were linked to Western uh, capital. 
But the question is, I mean, Dung is right. Doesn't matter whether the cat is black or white, just as long as it catches mice, you know? They had to be practical. And I would ask Helen, what was the practical alternative for them, for them? And um, uh, I don't think the uh, Chinese state has given up very much of anything. Uh, yeah, Goldman Sachs and, uh, and uh, a lot of big banks, they want to invest in China. Does that, uh, does that diminish China? I don't think so, Helen. I really don't. And the, the, cru the crucial question is where does ultimate power lie? Are there contradictions? Always gonna be contradictions, but how are they resolved? Are there contradictions among the people? Yes, there are. Are, are these antagonistic contradictions? I don't think so. Uh, another comment from Eric Hudson. He writes, Doc is all up in the real gospel this morning, <laughs> including, <laughs> including why Biden was selected and why Donald Trump was elected and on the, <laughs> and on the Capitol Hill rebellion, a significant moment in America that has terrified the liberal establishment down to its socks. This is why they cannot let the bones stay buried, least uh, black and brown folks who are being hounded and ground into the concrete get any ideas based upon the devastation and looting of our communities by the corporate state. The question really is if this government and, if it, and its temples of power, including Capitol Hill, are legitimate. That's right. I agree. That is the question. And that is the fear that uh, the people will increase and are, I mean, at least half the people see this uh, government as illegitimate and its power as illegitimate. Mm -hmm. uh, Chelsea Sprengler writes, if China is so imperialist, where's the bombs? Where are the economic institutions like the IMS, IMF robbing colonized nations through debt? Why would China provide zero interest loans to third world countries if they are imperialist? I don't think it's an accurate label. Uh, he Helen shares a article from Russia today about Greece selling its largest port to a Chinese company. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. So. Again, this question of legitimacy. I mean, that's also a question on the global state as well. I mean, we know at least half the American population sees the U.S. as the government, at least as illegitimate. Similarly, similar crises of legitimacy in the other Western countries. Some of you may have seen the video of French President Macron being slapped by a citizen at some rally. And there are many examples of that throughout the, all the G7 nations. And uh, so can you really have a cold war or any kind of war against a serious adversary if this is your situation at home? Mm -hmm. uh, and for the world, the rest of most of humanity uh, seeing this situation, I mean, this is the question, how will they think? The elites in these countries may still have a romantic view of the West, but can they really control their own populations That's and right. how they'll and they all don't have a romantic view. You know, in public, politicians have to perform like it's a Hollywood movie. But people like uh, uh, Nicholas Kristof or, or uh, Martin uh, Wolf that I were, you know, was quoting from, you know, like Nicholas Kristof says, the problem of America is Americans. You know, and, um, and Martin Wolf, Martin Wolf is not a fly by night. He said, yeah, we got all of these institutional advantages, but what is wrong? Why can't we, uh, why is quote, our democracy so troubled? That which means why are the people turning against these institutions? This is the question, but it is also a, it's almost a revolutionary question. 
when all sides are asking the same question. And the other thing is neither Christoph nor Martin Wolf mentioned the so-called greatest civil rights movement of all time, the Black Lives Matter last year. They understand what it was. It wasn't about black life, not at all. So, you know, um, let's keep it moving. Let's keep on attempting to understand. And to Helen, <laughs> you know, economics and finance and all of that, very complicated issues, especially with all of the talk of inflation and money and what is the, what is the function of money, what is, money as a commodity and the new monetary theory. You know, we kept talking for, for weeks about John Maynard Keynes and his innovation, his theoretical investigations. But, um, once you abandon theory on the economic questions, on the world economic questions, we need theory. Um, there, and the other thing is, and I forgive, we cannot be dogmatists. There has to be some flexibility, but, and we cannot in the name of democracy, that is China and other countries, abandon state power. You get nothing out of it. Well, it seems like that's it for comments for now. We're approaching 10 to 1. Maybe it's time to uh... I know you have to prepare. And that's right. Yeah, I have uh, some stuff going on tomorrow. So just for everyone, anyone who's interested, will be uh, myself and some other uh, South Asian members of the Free School will be speaking to a group uh, based in India uh, on their live stream tomorrow morning. Uh, U.S. time, it's tomorrow morning. East Coast time, I should say, is tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. Uh, it's on a Facebook page whose name is quite long, uh, N-I-T-Y-A-N-O-O-T-A-N. Uh, but I'll share it, uh, I'll share it on the free school page, uh, the link to their page so that you can uh, watch it if you're interested. Uh, if you're watching it, it'll be live streams. You can add your comments if you like, and you can also watch it later if you can't make the timing but for those. And, and maybe we'll get into, some, I think we'll probably get into some of these questions about it is about the crisis of Western democracy. So I think it'll be interesting to see what uh, these various, uh, you know, progressive kinds of activists and thinkers and professionals are thinking in uh, South Asia about these questions. So. Will it be in English? Uh, yeah, I think it's gonna be mostly in English. My talk okay. is gonna be in English, but some other stuff might not be in English. But yeah, enough will be in English for people to get. And just, you know, we're a month away, but on the weekends of uh, July 23rd and 24th and July 30th and 31st will be our commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Revolution. And it's titled Commemorating the 100th Anniversary of, not the China, Commemorating the 100th Anniversary of the Communist Party of China and Celebrating Our Struggle for Peace and Democracy. And the first weekend will begin with a symposium kind of town hall entitled, this is, I think y'all are gonna like this, The Artist, The Philosopher, and The Black Panther. Billy Yi, Grace Lee Boggs, and Elaine Brown. Uh, and the paths to China, to, uh, to the Chinese revolution uh, through the black freedom struggle. And uh, Elaine Brown is going to you know, give a presentation. Um, Lily Yi hopefully will be on site. She is the great artist and part of the um, of the uh, the Village of Arts and Humanities in North Philly. And of course, Grace Lee Boggs, who has uh, passed, but we're going to use certain of her interviews. And then on uh, that Saturday, we're going to devote it to explorations of the long march uh, and then the next weekend begins with a symposium on Mao Zedong 
and that should be a wonderful thing. Hopefully, uh, during the second weekend, uh, Martin Jacques and the English uh, translator for Deng Xiaoping uh, will both be participants. Uh, so, you know, uh, everybody keep your eyes open for that. We, we hope we'll be primarily live, uh, but we invite everybody. This is, and, and let me just say this, you know, the, we're doing some heavy lifting and the colleagues that I'm working with, Michelle, Emily and Alice, you know, we've been working every, every week, reading, studying, organizing for this. There's heavy lifting because the atmosphere of anti-China, this anti-China, the other, is so intense, but we feel that we got uh, a way to counter that reactionary propaganda with a narrative about peace and a single garment of destiny. And how China, you know, that, that idea for us of Chinese characteristics. Do people have a right to self-determination or do they have to uh, seek the approval of Western white elites sprinkled with some brown Asians and yellow Chinese and black Americans. You know, no, we don't think so. And so we want to explore the culture, the uh, history, the civilization of China's, of China and how it, um, how it parallels many of our own aspirations for freedom and democracy. All right, great. Well, it was definitely an exciting month for the Saturday Free School. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when is it not exciting? <laughs> now, hopefully, we'll be, uh, these events hopefully will be taking place in person, or at least some of them, yeah. uh, with some return to normalcy. Yeah. So, so, anyway, with that, we can uh, conclude for today. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next week.